Welcome back to The Mining Pod. On today's show, we're joined by Jim Seto of Epic Blockchain. Epic Blockchain is working on next generation alternatives to MicroBT and Bitmain. We talk about chip efficiency, how to think about ASIC production, and Intel's place in Bitcoin mining. Are you a retail or institutional investor interested in Bitcoin mining companies? The Miner Mag brings you free data and analysis from all major NASDAQ listed Bitcoin mining operations to know who stands out. Check out visualized metrics and data dependent stories at theminermag.com. Jim, welcome to the Mining Pod. It's been a long time coming. Uh, really excited for this conversation. There's a lot to unpack about Epic, a lot to unpack about yourself and your history in the mining space and the larger chip space. Uh, but again, welcome to the show. Great. Uh, thank you for having me. This is not my natural comfort zone. You have the dubious honor of being the first person that uh, I've ever done an interview with in 20 plus years. And uh, so I'm going to give it a college try and uh, share a little bit about what Epic's doing. Um, our trajectory, how we see the market, and uh, really uh, open it up for you to ask questions that uh, I can try to answer. Awesome. Okay. Well, we'll jump right into the background. Uh, I do think a decent amount of miners know about Epic at this point. Um, you guys have been sending out press releases, had some interesting partnerships with Intel and the like, and I know your DMs are full of questions about that. Um, but your background, first and foremost, just as a designer and a technologist in the space would be really of interest, and then we can dive into Epic itself. Sure. I am an engineer by trade. Um, I cut my teeth and make signal design in semiconductors uh, 20 plus years, uh, working with some very large firms. My my role in in, in, in this journey of my education and my, my work is uh, taking me to many different places, and uh, I would not have thought if you asked me 30 years ago, would I be leading the charge of a, of a crypto blockchain company, I would have said no, I would have bet the other way. Uh, but uh, my background is actually on semiconductors, driving value with the, that level of integration. And I've had the fortunate uh, benefit of seeing transitions, for example, in the PC space and in the mobile space. And uh, I uh, all the experience that I bring from that world, it really feels like the vibe is there again in terms of a digital ledger technology, proof of work, and leveraging that uh, that uh, critical functionality that I think is needed in the future for this space. Every so often I hear people come from TSMC or Samsung and come from the chip division, stuff like that. Can you give like a general overview of like what the last 20 years, this, this is a very abstract question, like what the relationship has been for some of these people leaving some of those big brand names yeah. in the chip industry and, and going out and founding new technology companies? Because that seems to be like a big sticking point for anyone who's going to go and design an ASIC product is like they need to have a background in one of these big fabs. Yes, uh, absolutely. Uh, relationship really matters. Uh, relationship is built over time. Uh, and by definition, uh, a relationship is all about trust and uh, track record. And uh, in the semiconductor space, I always thought it was a, a small orbit or a small ecosystem, and it is. But coming into the blockchain space, I've also discovered that it's actually similar here too. It's who you know. Uh, how well you're connected, and what you can bring to the table. And uh, for us as a company, we want to scale. Besides the innovation, which I already know we had, and frankly, that's the reason I decided to to join Epic and to help the team there, was to bring the other equation, which is uh, operational excellence, scale. And with respect to how the foundries have evolved over the two or three decades, I mean, there's a whole concept called uh, the fabulous semiconductor model where no one company can actually own the whole solution from bottom to top. So picking your partners really matter, uh, picking your technology really matters. And uh, if I look at all the inflection points in the other industries that I come from, those who made the right selections and also had the right patience were the ones that prevailed. So I think that will continue in, in the mobile space and the high performance compute space. And we're just on the on the runway now, I think, for some of the blockchain uh, growth that I see out there, having that as as part of our, our I'll call it tool set inside of Epic, uh, is going to help us going forward. Definitely. Okay, we'll return that question a little bit when we talk about Epic itself and some of the partnerships and relationships it's made to be able to actually design an ASIC mm-hmm. and bring a product uh, to, to market. Let's talk about Epic itself sure. first uh, First of all, though, like the background, the, the founding day, co-founders, okay. uh, how you guys think about like your products. It, the stuff that you were already bringing to market or have brought to market in the past, those sort of things. Okay, that's a, that's a great question. So uh, I am not a founder. 
I'm, uh, I came in early enough. Uh, fortunately, I think the founders, uh, with their raw talent and uh, passion, realized that the other side of the equation was needed, which was, uh, uh, like I said, a, a focus on operational excellence, be it manufacturing, be it uh, financial uh, financial uh, uh, management. And having walked the path for the last few decades in the design space and moving into the operational space and moving into the, uh, I'll call it, uh, revenue generation phase, uh, it was a, a perfect fit in that regard. We joke about it at the office is I call myself the intern uh, because I'm learning so much. And I like it that way because also uh, the ingredients, I think, inside of Epic, it is actually an environment where people can learn People can grow, and uh, and it's not just related to where you are in your your journey in your career, whether it's I call it learning, earning, or returning. And for myself, frankly, I'm in the returning phase of my career, but I'm still learning. And I think that's that's a, a uniqueness about what Epic has as a company. And started in 2018, we actually cut our teeth in the uh, altcoin space. And a lot of people, when we we're starting our seed funding says, well, why don't you do a, a SHA-256 chip? Why don't you do an AI chip? And frankly, we know how to do that, and we can do that. But uh, our, our view, uh, and it was more of a, I'll call it pragmatic innovation, was, um, how do I say this? Uh, if you're a David and you want to take on Goliath, and you try to take them head on, you're probably going to be ending up come on the sidewalk. And uh, we didn't want to do that. And uh, our approach really was, and sometimes I use the athlete analogy, you have to build up your muscle memory, you have to build up your muscle strength, you have to build up your cardio, you have to build up your endurance, you have to learn from your losses. Uh, if you actually try to do that uh, in the, uh, I'll call it uh, limelight right away, things are stacked against you. So our approach was to do all that from a development perspective in a space where, frankly, no one was watching us. So we did that, and it's worked out well. Uh, along the way, we still get the questions all the time. Why aren't you doing a Bitcoin chip? Or why don't you pivot to AI? And uh, we always know we can, but we think of our capabilities of parallel processing, low power compute, could be on any workload. And uh, AI is obviously one workload. Uh, proof of work is another workload uh, going forward. There could be many other workloads in the blockchain space, and we'll be ready for that. So our engagement in the last 12 months has been uh, uh, very rewarding in the sense that, uh, not necessarily monetary, but from the perspective of people recognizing what we can do. Love that. So you brought up this question kind of within your, your answer there. There's a lot of Goliaths out there, Bitmain being the biggest one, MicroBT sort of also kind of coming up and doing what a lot of the ASIC manufacturers are basic chip designers right now are trying to do, right? Like micro BT was sort of able to like figure it out last cycle, but they kind of took a step back in the middle of this micro BT pop popped up. Tell me a little bit about how you guys see the competition right now okay. for your product. Um, um, you'd be as abstract as you want there. Well, okay, no, we'll just... uh, uh, I'll take it in many different directions. Uh, thesis uh, in, and again, it, if, if, it's, if I'm leveraging the tried and true methodologies and in other industries into this space, it's because I believe it worked and I know it worked, is if you look at, uh, there tends to be in our industry, in the blockchain industry, uh, a lot of focus on uh, nanometers, frankly, uh, 16 to 12 to 7 to 5 to 3. And uh, I, I describe what we have to do in the hardware space as, as a set of layers. And there's a technology layer, there's a design layer, and there's a system layer. And in the uh, high-performance compute space, there's actually this uh, four-letter acronym that we talk about, which is design, technology, co-optimization, DTCO. The technology is obvious. It's the, the vector of 16 to 12, Moore's Law, frankly. And the, the design uh, layer, uh, the D part, is all, again, about your methodology, whether it's a, a kind of digital synthesis, full custom, dynamic logic, parallel, series like differential logic, each step along the way, uh, you could combine them in any way you can. And I go back to even our own industry here in blockchain. If I think about it, in 2016, uh, it was the uh, the golden era for the S9. Um, and in that phase, 
the industry went from 28 to 16, planar technology to FinFET technology. And that was a boon for uh, the bit main team. And we look at them and with a tremendous amount of respect because uh, they have the, the growth and they have the track record. But for them to take advantage of that inflection point, uh, they execute it with the concept of the ASIC miner. And then they continue to ride that curve, if you like, from 16 to 12 and to 7. And they did very well. But if I think about how MicroPT has entered the space, they changed the equation from just relying on technology to relying on design. So when I think about the design for the MicroPT, they actually went from digital synthesis logic to full custom. So we studied that very closely as well. And that allowed them to actually, frankly, stay in an older node. I think it was 16 or 12 and outperform a seven. For the people who, who were in that era, uh, era, it's, we're such a young industry, but I still call it an era, uh, from uh, 2016 to 2020, uh, that was the uh, coming of MicroBT. And we studied them very carefully as well. And they, they, the S9 phase was all about uh, the T in the uh, next generation sliding into the next happening. I think it was more of the D. And as we slide into the 2024 happening, what's also starting to happen is that acronym is actually growing. It's uh, S D T C O co-optimization, system design technology. So the solution that some people might go is stay on the technology curve, try to ride from 12 to seven to five to three. Uh, some might actually try to go and uh, right, the design curve that I think going into the next halving, um, the S and the D really matters. Um, the system design and the uh, actual design of the SOC. Um, to the degree that history will repeat itself, where a 7 nanometer can outperform a 5 nanometer, uh, it'll be the fact that uh, the system was designed, designed correctly and the design curve which we know is happening is the whole differential logic, network processing, design flows are coming into this space. And and frankly, that's some of the players that people have started to hear about, Chain Reaction, Intel, uh, and ourselves. So uh, when we have these new relationships that are forming, uh, they look at Epic and they say, well, you understand our language because you're a, a chip company. You understand design methodology as well as you actually know the customers in the system. So they've come to us to say, we're chip guys. We know nothing about the system. You guys do. Uh, let's collaborate. And uh, it's been a great, uh, great um, crossroad for us. Let's go back to like the node part of this, because sure. I've, I've definitely heard about that a little bit as well, where in the past has always been about like the race to decreasing the size of the wafer, the node, as you guys call it, like from, mm -hmm. you know, like, 12 to, to 6 to 5 to 3 or whatever the numbers are. Um, I'm a professor now. Tell me a little bit about why that has been the focus historically and how you see like system designs mm -hmm. becoming more important in this next era. Uh, why would like how I house my miner or how I design like the other factors within the miner become more important on the efficiency front? Um, so the historical equation for Moore's Law is doubling the density and doubling the performance in, in a, a very short period of time. But what has really changed in the last, I'll call it decade, is the cost curve of that uh, functionality, higher density, um, higher performance, um, has started to work against it. So it's actually very expensive to do a 5 nanometer prototype, very expensive to do a, a 5 nanometer uh, wafer. Uh, so... Uh, the other side of the of the uh, I call it Rubik's cube of running a, a smart enterprise is that the financials have to make sense. So if the economics are not there, is yes, I built something that is uh, better and faster, but it ain't cheaper. Uh, you 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 fall out of that uh, I'll call it the uh, sustainable model, and we we know that is happening. So if people are rushing from five to three, hoping that they can get uh, potentially uh, lower joules per terahash, it's going to be very expensive. Then the question has to be is, will the market that it serves be willing to pay for that? 
So uh, I don't profess to understand where the Bitcoin price is going to go, but if the economics of it uh, are where they are, I think it's very hard to rationalize a three nanometer uh, design. And by the way, that's not unique to our space here in, in blockchain. Uh, we know all the other players in the high performance compute or mobile space are also moving to three nanometer very slowly. And then the question is, is, is it because it's not ready? Which may be depending on which foundry you talk to, uh, but the reality is it's also uh, no one will pay more for for that incremental functionality and feature. So uh, there's even an argument, frankly, that five nanometer is very expensive, and and we know it is. Uh, we follow that very very closely from uh, 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 cost to manufacture inside the foundries. Uh, so I, I truly believe that if somebody can innovate in those other spaces at the system level and the uh, design level, and use an older node, we sometimes call it N minus uh, one, they can prevail and they should prevail. Do you think it's kind of like a, a marketing failure or making maybe a marketing gimmick that people always talk about, like the nanometer size? Because I feel like that's absolutely what I always hear. Absolutely it is. And um, I think the other thing too is uh, the whole upcoming transition from five nanometer to three nanometer depending on which foundry you use, uh, they're going about it in a different way. And uh, apologize if this is a, a rabbit hole, but in one foundry, their, their approach to three nanometer is actually new technology called uh, nano sheet technology or uh, gate, uh, gate all around. Sounds cool. It is cool. Uh, the technologist will have to say, is it ready? Uh, and what do you gain for it? Other foundries might stay with the traditional FinFET technology from five to three is because they architected their silicon design early enough so that you could actually take it to three. Time will tell. Uh, usually what happens is if a new technology like that is introduced, besides earlier what I mentioned it being more expensive, to actually purely manufacture it, the, the yields are typically lower. And the other piece that is also not uh, well understood or often overlooked is in the silicon industry, uh, modeling is very important. Uh, to produce a prototype takes a long time. Uh, you cannot just try it, build it, and see what you get. That's a three-month, four-month uh, cycle of learning. So to the degree that the modeling is done correctly early and you have faith in that model, uh, you can actually do a lot of validation earlier. So we also bring to the, the, uh, to the table the whole thought of uh, fast cycles of learning and fast uh, course corrections uh, and frankly iterating earlier rather than uh, regrettably we saw it in the previous industry I came from and potentially in this industry that we're in now is uh, sometimes products are released into the market when they're not ready and they put it out there and unfortunately the poor customer has to has to endure that cycle of learning and uh, the uh, and I got, and I go back to the previous industry that I came from uh, if those players just didn't care because they knew they had to buy their product, eventually those things will sort themselves out. Uh, in this current industry, uh, the, the seven to five to three, uh, I frankly worry that people are rushing to three and uh, who may have to suffer. So our, our approach has always been to try to capture all of that quality and functionality earlier and, and frankly not let the customer pay for it. It's an interesting perspective I haven't heard, uh, which I'm glad we're getting it. So it's just, uh, again, uh, I get, yeah. I'm rambling as I am. You can just uh, cut me off. But, uh, no, no, it's, it's a perspective we haven't heard, and that's good to hear about because definitely in 2021 and 2022, with like the XP coming out from Bitmain and some of micro BT's latest models, there was a lot of talk. I think it was about five nanometer at the time. Um, and then I started saying like three nanometer stuff and like Apple getting allocations for stuff like that. And people were started talking about it. I got really excited for Bitcoin mining, um, but it's good to hear like a fresh opinion that like that might be a waste of capital at this time and might not be useful. We still have to know, right? We still have to like iterate and like look at it. One last question on that before um, we dive into like Epic products themselves. The capital side of things, this seems extremely capital, capital intensive. How do you guys balance the capital side of things being like not a okay. huge company? And yeah. how do other companies balance this as well? I mean, I imagine Bitmain is having to pay so much money to have their allocations as well, right? So how do they balance it? 
Absolutely. Uh, and uh, I guess maybe I was a, a student of history. If we, we, when we did our initial uh, investor round and when I joined the company uh, 2021, we did a, a little raise with uh, uh, to get capital. And if our story to our uh, potential investor was, look, in two years, our, our little scrappy startup of 20 people will have, I'll call it a seven nanometer design and a five nanometer design going to market and traction with 10, 12 different big OEMs. Uh, and we're going to do it on this uh, $7 million raise. I probably would have been thrown out of a room. But if you fast forward to 2022, that's exactly what we did. And people don't realize that until maybe they look backwards and go, wow, those guys actually did that. And the fair question to ask is, how did they do that? And we did that by picking our partners carefully and, frankly, the partners looking at us saying, okay. Um, and it gets back to, I think, how the industry will be moving to uh, call it a collaborative. The acronym that I grew up in was called the Fabulous Semiconductor Model but it's really more of a uh, distributed uh, development model. And that's how we did it. Uh, Intel, with their uh, deep resources, actually naturally funded the, the, their, uh, their chip, but they gave it to us to, to go to market. And that history is repeating itself again with uh, a strong company like uh, Chain Reaction uh, coming to us. So the bootstrapping is the acronym that startups always like to use, but we, we use the word of... of pragmatic innovation where uh, we're very careful with our spend and our capital um, and we execute. So uh, a little different, but again, I could be corrected, but I don't think anyone else has done that. Uh, last bit there, you're going to throw the, the question back at you, the the capital allocation for some of the other players. Do you have any insights into how like the micro BTs and, and the bit mains allocate to capital to some of those like these um, on the ASIC chip side of things? I do, but I, I think it's probably best that, uh, uh, I think what they do is probably not unique uh, to how, uh, you know, other people in other industries do it. When you have deep pockets, uh, you could, uh, as they say, throw money at the problem. Yeah. And eventually something will come out. Do you do four different variants and hope, uh, you know, three of them might fail, but one of them will, right? Uh, that's not, for me, an efficient use of capital. Another one, too, is uh, time to market being the, the uh, prevailing um, care about is um, let's ship it if we're not ready. And uh, that doesn't work for me either. And uh, so you talk about capital allocation is uh, we have ultimate respect for timing and time to market and all that stuff. Uh, but if it's not ready, it takes courage to say, okay, we might miss this window, uh, but we're not going to make our customers suffer. It's really more of, of I'll call it, the North Star that drives our company, which is the direction we want to go to is to be a long-term player and not a transactional player. Um, frankly, we have people coming to us and saying, well, I could get this Bitmain or Micro BT at this garage sale at, you know, uh, sub $10 per terahash. You know, why can't you do it? And I go, well... Uh, you're a buyer, then you're not a sourcing strategist, and I might be do, able to do it. Do I want to do it? Uh, no. Do I have to do it? No. Then um, let's stay in touch. And, um, and I'm okay with that because the people who have a sourcing strategy understand that uh, diversity matters, uh, geographic diversity matters, integrity matters, and those are the bigger players that I think will prevail in our industry. Gotcha. Thanks for that. Okay, let's go to Epic Products. I've been teasing that for a sure. bit. Uh, for the listener, tell us a little bit about some of the products you guys have launched, launched recently from like ASIC chips all the way up to like some of the bigger stack products. Great. Um, okay. Control boards, firmware, all that stuff. Yeah, I, I should talk a lot more about our company and uh, versus the technology and the industry. Uh, the We have three lines of business. One is our chip development business, which we've actually consciously uh, slowed down and actually flipped it a little bit to uh, design services because people know we can do it and they say, uh, can you do this for us? And so we look at that. Uh, the second line of business, and uh, we've actually gotten feedback, is it's, it's really odd that you're doing it, is we, what we call our fleet enhancement uh, business. 
where through our early engagement with our clients, they said, wow, you could do that with your altcoin. You return my phone call and the quality is there. Look at what we have here. Uh, these are some of our pain points. And we look at it and say, you know, if you do A, B, or C, you will actually get higher uh, throughput, higher hash, or, or uh, better, uh, better uptimes. And, you know, they said, can you do more of that? And one of our thinking initially was, wait a sec, am I helping my competition by doing that? And we step back and say, that may be the case, but we believe we're also helping our customers. So some of our fleet enhancement, whether it's the firmware or whether it's the uh, microcontroller boards, uh, we can actually offer uh, that a solution where uh, they can re respond to a rapid curtailment very easily. Um, they can overclock dynamically, and it's not with our hardware. It's with someone else's hardware. And uh, to our clients, they go, these guys do get it. They understand the system. Uh, they're not afraid to help us. And uh, let's watch the space. So that's our second line of business. Uh, we're, we've been doing it with the, the Bitmain. Uh, it's public knowledge. Uh, very quickly, we're going to be rolling out our micro BT uh, solutions in that space. The interest level has actually been very high. So uh, we're quite proud of it, but I, I, I would say it's almost accidental. But uh, here we are. Um, and then the third line of business is now the emerging ASIC miners in the SHA-256 space. Uh, our, what we call our Gen 1 is our block miner, rolling it out with Intel. Intel will tell you they are a chip company, they are not a system company. So uh, when we approached them and said, uh, you know some of us from our previous lives, uh, the semiconductor high performance compute is a small industry. Uh, and uh, we said, let us again show you what you already know, but what we can do. And uh, we started working with Intel. Very quickly, I think they realized that uh, besides the integrity and the technical chops, uh, there was, I'll call it a passion to help them because it was a market that they did not understand. And uh, so that worked out well for us. And um, a lot of learning. Uh, the customers that we are ramping with see it, receive it. Uh, we've actually been able to outperform uh, the other Intel solutions that are out there. And uh, that's great for us. And uh, history, I think, is going to repeat itself again with our Gen 2. Awesome. Yeah, you guys only have some interesting partnerships, which has caught people's eye. Uh, we'll start with the big one, Intel. So my understanding is they made the chips and you guys are building the system for it. Walk me through that, uh, how that partnership came about, how you guys approached them. Okay. Uh, uh, definitely was like a head turner and has continued to be one. So people are interested in it. Sure. Um, yeah, I kind of led into it a little bit already is uh, when it was public knowledge that Intel had uh, three, maybe four uh, lead customers who were going to buy the chip and go to market with a system. There sometimes is a uh, oversimplification or I'll, I'll call it dismissiveness that, well, once I have the chip, uh, the, the hash board and the control board and the power supply, that's easy. So as long as I can get the chip, uh, I can go to market with my, my widget, my, my ASIC miner. And that's just not the reality. And even some of those players, as they got the chips, realized, what did I just do? And, uh, but fortunately for one of them, that we had been working with them already before, uh, they made the smart decision is from the get-go, if they uh, get the chips from Intel, we're going to give it to Epic. And uh, so even some of our own dialogues through that uh, path with Intel in a three-way kind of conversations, the folks at Intel said, oh, well, they're asking the right questions. So we went from there. And then in parallel, because of our prior relationships with Intel, we just went to uh, the, the division and said, you know, we're working with uh, this other company already with your product. Uh, we think we can build one as well in a more broader base uh, application. Through their trust in us, they said, let's give uh, this small startup a bunch of chips and see what they can do. No, no, no harm, no foul. And uh, within 90 days, uh, one quarter, we actually had a system working that was outperforming what they were doing in their own labs. So uh, again, um, the, the wake up call along that whole journey with Intel was very smart people, very technical people, chip oriented, but they really recognize that without a partnership, I'll call it 
when they say we want you to be our Dell, uh, is the recognition that the whole system design, the firmware development, and the relationship with the customers really matter. So we brought that to the table. Unfortunately, they, they put a pause on some of that uh, just because of their own challenges. Uh, but fair to say, we, we stay in touch and we know what they're doing. And uh, as I mentioned earlier, our industry is very small. And uh, when the time is right, who knows? Yeah, I can think of a few of the other miners that were included in that press release from, I think it was like 2021. So it was like Grid, Argo, Block, Hive. Uh, I don't know if you guys were in the initial press release, but... No, we were not. Those those miners were there. Hive is the only one that has brought a product to market, and they've not really released any details about it. And they say it competes with Bitmain, but they haven't released okay. efficiency, and they haven't released I don't know, the power of the machine. You may know it, but I'd be curious to know, like, what are some of the challenges these miners faced immediately okay. when they, after they purchased? And why do you think they went into this purchase decision if... It is such like a technical problem, and miners don't have, don't really have those chops, right? They, they yeah, something yeah. different. So, a couple of points. Um, the uh, buzz miner that Hive has, um, I know they've rammed. Um, we've been asked at different times to help in terms of that development in different ways, uh, not directly with Hive, but I think when Intel initially rolled out their uh, uh, chip, they provided guidance. Uh, they worked with uh, maybe a contract manufacturers is this is how you should maybe physically connect everything together. Sometimes it's referred to as a reference design. But by definition, a reference design is never the final, final incarnation. And if the contract manufacturer, and sometimes by definition, a contract manufacturer just, just does what they are told, is does not have the ability to triage, diagnose, course correct, and and fix it. Uh, what they start with and what they end up with will be the same. If it was uh, wrong at the beginning, it'll be wrong at the end. If it was perfect at the beginning, it'll be perfect at the end. But we know in this case where uh, a lot of learning has to happen, I assure you that what you start and what you finish is never the same thing. And there's sometimes, as I said, there could be a, a dismissive or oversimplification is once I have a reference design, I could stamp it out. And that's just not the case. In our situation, uh, when Intel started talking to us, we said, we'll, we'll look at the reference design, uh, but we will do our own. And that's exactly what we did. Our own being also based on the input from some of the uh, uh, other customers that initially uh, asked us to work with them. And so designing it, I'll call it from a blank sheet with a, a correct understanding of what you're trying to do it makes a difference. And uh, that's how we, we, we see uh, our solution. And it's public knowledge now. We landed uh, with a miner that is, is between an M30 S++ and an M50, uh, 31, 32 joules per terahash. Uh, I'm not afraid to talk about it. Uh, other people might be reluctant to discuss the the uh, efficiency because perhaps they're not there or perhaps they want to uh, keep it confidential. And I respect that. Uh, for me, uh, I could say uh, we, we worked with a giant like Intel. Uh, we produced a product and this is where we landed. Feedback is, is, wow, you did that on your first iteration and you're near the top of the top of the pack. What more can you do? And you know, that's why we feel our Gen 2 is actually going to push the, push us even further along. So uh, I'm okay with that. Uh, again, it's the pragmatic innovation. We were not going to make promises that, uh, you know, uh, uh, we're going to take over the world because I think uh, that's more hype. Love it. So let's go to like the the market side of things. Bring something to market like this is really, really challenging, right? Especially with Bitmain just being so large. Micro BT that caught a break in the middle of the dispute with Bitmain and that. 2017, 20 uh -huh. period, you know, microBT kind of had a golden moment there and um, I, probably around like 10 to 20% of the market, depending on like how you look at uh, sales and importations and stuff like that. For you guys, how do you think about like growing in this like very tough okay. market and so maybe something like the chain reaction news, as uh -huh. you said, would be like relevant here? Okay. When I, when I, when I wear my uh, VC uh, mentoring hat, I always look at, uh, at a team and I, I ask myself, is there a market for what they're uh, trying to produce? 
uh, versus the classical um, having a solution but looking for a problem to solve, and, which is backwards. If I look at directionally where um, this um, Bitcoin mining space, I use the, the kind of high watermark of one zeta hash. Uh, the market will need one zeta hash of mining compute in a very short time, uh, sooner rather than later. I think at one time people thought one zeta hash would be in 2040. I think it's going to be uh, before 2030, if not earlier. And uh, if you do the math on that very simplistically and assume one machine is uh, 125 terahash, uh, divide that into one zeta hash, that's 8 million miners. If you look at the refresh cycle, again, just using simple math, uh, maybe half of it could be replaced on an annual basis. Four million miners a year. Uh, can the industry get that all filled out by one player, two players? We we strongly believe the industry needs a, a more credible uh, third uh, player, and uh, we believe it can be us. The uh, challenge, I believe, going forward is is not going to be demand, but it's going to be uh, the relationships at the foundries. The foundries themselves have to pick the, the horses that they want to ride with. They also cannot afford to be uh, single-threaded, as in uh, ultimately dependent on one client, uh, because if there's a hiccup and our industry is, is as volatile, there can be hiccups, uh, it can be material to their capacity planning. So the, the strategy we see inside of foundries is that they would like, uh, I'll call it typically, a second, if not a third, credible player uh, in their space to to frankly book their capacity. So we know in the case, and again, it's, it's public knowledge, and, and I, I, I praise them for it, is, is Bitmain has a very strong relationship with TSMC. But geographically, they're all concentrated in uh, the Far East. Uh, a foundry may actually want to look and diversify and have a customer base that can consume those wafers outside of China, as in uh, the, the uh, China account. Uh, which unfortunately has been probably a, a pragmatic problem for MicroBT or Canon is that uh, they're also in China. Uh, so what's working for us besides our, our track record and prior relationships is we're in the right spot geographically. And uh, so from their perspective of, of risk mitigation inside the foundry space, do they actually want a credible partner uh, that could take wafers from them besides uh, the well-established path from Bitmain. So for us, you know, we're all in North America uh, and uh, we bring a lot of innovation and integrity to the table and uh, we know that's going to work for us. Yeah, I mean, that's been a big geopolitical topic right now. It's, again, kind of going back to the top of the show, it's funny how like Bitcoin mining has like all these different uh, needs and inputs from people from across different industries that it's also becoming like this geopolitical question, right? Where you know, we need domestic chip production in the U.S. has been a big thing. The Chips Act was passed last year by my administration. who tried to actively incentivize mm -hmm. TSMC and Samsung and Intel to start like building within the U.S. Uh, and here you guys are one of the basic builders. And it's a smaller portion of whatever is going to be built for chip production, but it's still a part of it, right? So tell me a little bit about how you guys talk with like maybe and if you don't correct me but like politicians or look on the, okay. on the local level or uh the national level i suppose okay how you guys interact with that that conversation or even just how you do it earlier in the begin at the beginning of this uh this podcast i told you i've never given an interview before and that's true so if you ask me if i've talked to many politicians uh it's probably even less and <laughs> Not because uh, I don't think it's necessary or I think it's important to get the message out there. Uh, and I think it's a, probably more a matter of, of more when than if. But uh, our, our shaping, our influence has probably been more with uh, our execution. And uh, I, I firmly believe history just repeats itself on those, on those vectors is if uh, the uh, trusted, smart, capable people continue to execute, uh, the spotlight or attention naturally flows that way. And, you know, you talked about the semiconductor industry, the onshoring that's happened. This was probably before you were even born, but 
uh, <laughs> in the early uh, and and uh, I regret seeing it happen now. Frankly, is is in the eighties, uh, semiconductors was really taking off in North America. Uh, fabs, uh, foundries, factories were going up, and there were people who were afraid of that. You know, they said, "Oh, they're polluting my water." They're, all the smokestack is blowing all this pollutants into the air. Get out. Not in my backyard. And, you know, you kind of fast forward to now, it's probably those same politicians are saying, please come back. So if people had the foresight to say, and, and back then in the 80s, there were people saying, okay, we hear your feedback. Listen to what we are trying to do to clean things up and uh, address your concerns. Some of the states that listened you know, I'm going to call them out, is I'll say Arizona or Oregon, no surprise, that's where Intel is, uh, they were able to establish a, a decent footprint there. When I think about geopolitical headwinds now in our industry where people are saying, get out because you're, you know, you're taking too much electricity or it's allowed, I wish they would have the uh, wisdom to say, you know, don't let history repeat itself in the negative way. And uh, I, I applaud the people who are out there uh, trying to talk and evangelize of what our industry is doing, because I think more of it needs to happen. Um, but uh, honestly speaking, in our stage, in our in our uh, journey, uh, with only 20 people, uh, I don't think a politician would return my phone call. <laughs> fair, fair. Okay, last question for you, and this is somewhat going back to the Intel question, also kind of wrapping into what you were just saying. Yeah. How are some of these larger manufacturers and these these chip producers thinking about Bitcoin miners at this point? Is it there's a little bit more respect in this industry, or is it uh, similar? Like, yeah, uh, you guys are small allocation. I'm not. I think it's changing, and, I, and my metric is 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 the types of queries that I'm getting and by who. And um, Intel is the one we've talked a lot about, but uh, our relationships into let's say a TSMC or, or Samsung. They have their own business development people. They have their own people who look at technology. And uh, when they're in a dialogue with us about what do you need, they're not asking me uh, what do you need because they know I'm going to uh, pivot from uh, the pivot from parallel processing, low power applications. They know that blockchain, uh, hardware for Web three, even frankly hardware for for proof of stake. People don't realize you need uh, efficiently well designed hardware for that space to scale. Uh, so they do their homework and they are talking to us asking for that so it it is a small part of their equation but uh, they don't want to lose sight of it love it Jim thank you so much for your time today alright take care <laughs>